Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. What a joy it is to be with you all uh, this morning and together study God's Word. As we look at the world around us, what do we see? We see emptiness, right? Emptiness, anguish, anxiety, worry, sorrow in the hearts of many. Just at this moment of time, many in the world are yearning for joy and satisfaction. <clears throat> so let me ask a question to all those of us here and anybody who hears this later, the sound of this word. What is the solution to this emptiness and sorrow? How can one find true joy and satisfaction? If you go to the pages of history, some in the world, they look to philosophy. The question is, can it help? Voltaire, the great philosopher, at the end of his life wrote, I wish I had never been born. Some in the world look towards pleasure to find joy. Lord Byron is such an example. The British poet and uh, whose poetry and personality cap captured the imagination of Europe lived a pleasure, life of pleasure, and he wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Some look for joy in money. Jay Gold, the American millionaire, the railroad magnate, generally identified as one of the robber barons of the Gilded Age, has had plenty of money. When dying, he said, I suppose I'm the most miserable man on earth. Joy cannot be found in money. Joy cannot be found in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. Having done so, he wept in his tent because he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Where then is real joy found? Nowhere in the world. The word of God, the Bible has the answer. The answer is simple. It is found in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And it comes in and through a deep relationship, an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, we are in the Lord's well, starting a series. The book of Philippians, it's one of the nine epistles or letters that Paul writes to various churches that are recorded for us as part of the inspired word of God. It consists of just four chapters and 104 verses. It is one of the prison epistles Paul writes from the prison along with <clears throat> Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And it overflows with the theme of joy. At least he mentions the word rejoicing, joy, gladness, at least some 19 or 20 times in these four short chapters in these 104 verses. And so this, in spite of his circumstance, which humanly speaking, right, he was in a prison, that's not a place where I think you obtain joy, humanly speaking. But Paul radiates a contagious joy. He reminds us that ultimate joy is something that is not obtained from whatever we think this comfortable, cozy circumstances of this world, but it comes from a vibrant relationship and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we study the book of Philippians, the next few weeks we'll discover the path to true and lasting joy that comes only from the Lord Jesus Christ, from God. And also we'll discover several other precious truths and practical applications. This book is a very practical book, right? It shows us how we ought to live. Again, the famous chapter, chapter two, and especially in verse three it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant can, than yourselves. It's a book about Christ. It's a Christological book. It's, shows us the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The Lord of verses, just uh, a couple from uh, chapter 2, verse 6, talking about Christ. Who, there, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being formed in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This book talks about salvation. It is soteriological. It's very clear how we are made right in the sight of God. Chapter 3, verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Throughout the ages, this book has encouraged so many. And so we find so many precious verses, a lot more verses that are precious to us and to so many. And so as we begin the journey of studying this precious book, so I would like to devote this morning to the introduction of this book of Philippians. So with that, let's open our Bibles and read two passages. First, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 48. I didn't mention that here, but just the highlights there. But let's open our Bibles and read that. And then also we'll read the first two verses of Philippians. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and in her household and she, as well, she urged us saying, if you had judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She, fo she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But then when her owners saw that a hope of gain was gone, they seized fallen silence and dragged them to the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in, uh, into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, uh, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembled with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that, they had, that he had believed in God. 
But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. The jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to us, uh, sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly and condemned men who are Ro Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do, do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported those, these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they, when they, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. The first two verses of Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in, at Philippi, the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we bow down together in a moment of prayer for the Lord's help? <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. This <coughs> precious letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi almost 2,000 years back. And so, Lord, we ask you this morning to speak to us in this day and age so we may learn the truths that the apostle has taught the saints at Philippi. <coughs> Lord, we ask you, Lord, to help us, to enable us to be serious students of the scripture. And Lord, to treat this letter seriously, not to some church 2,000 years back, but to us personally, individually, and to us corporately. Arsley by the chapel and help us Lord so that we learn and we will profit from it and so Lord we ask all this most precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen so normally I say we will want to title today's meditation as so I was just thinking right so I thought it's just an introduction to Philippians right which is an epistle of joy so what do we do? I think uh, what I'll try to do here is ask, us, ask ourselves a series of questions, and then let's try to answer them. First, who wrote Philippians? I think it's very simple, right? So we see it as the Apostle Paul. There is no dispute about it, no doubt about it. We have both internal and external evidence. Paul here says in the verse that we read, from Paul, and this letter also discusses much of Paul's life. So we see that in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. External evidence also proves that Paul wrote this book. Polycarp, the early church father, was martyred by being burned, burned at the snake, uh, stake in Smyrna in AD 160. He writes a letter to the Philippian church around AD 110. And in that letter, he says, again, I quote this from page 124. Of the apostle <coughs> fathers, I, I, I got this from the internet. Uh, Neither I nor any like me can keep pace with the wisdom of the blessed and glorious Paul, who, when he was among you in the presence of the men of that time, accurately and reliably taught the word concerning the truth. And when he was absent, he wrote to you letters. If you study them carefully, you'll be able to build yourself up in the faith that has been given to you. You also see the same thing again mentioned by his student, <clears throat> Irenaeus. Also said Paul wrote Philippians. Again, Clement of Alexandria in 8190, the great biblical scholar and teacher, he also says that he write, Paul wrote this. And so we have so much external evidence as well. Who are the recipients of this book? Right? It's very clear again, right? Here it says in verse 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Just a quick historical background on Philippi. I have a little picture here. Uh, the name of the city of Philippi was originally Krenitz, it means literally springs. <coughs> 10 miles inland from the Aegean Sea, the Roman province of Macedonia. 
In 356 BC, Philip II, king of Macedonia and father of Alexander the Great, he renamed the town after himself and he enlarged it. Then in 42 BC, the Roman commanders Octavian, Antony and Lepidus, they defeated Brutus and Cassius in a battle fought just west of Philippi. And after that battle, Philippi becomes a military colony. Many, many Roman army veterans, they make Philippi their home. <laughs> then we see another later battles, 42 and 31 BC, and they resulted in Philippi receiving higher status in the Roman Empire. The citizens, they enjoyed autonomous government, they received immunity from taxes, and they received a life as if they were live, living in Italy. And we also see in Acts itself, right? <coughs> Philippi was a leading city of the district of Macedonia, referring to its colon, uh, colonial status. It was the only Roman colony in that area. And also it said that the main highway <coughs> via Ignatia, it go, going from Rome towards the east, the main highway, it was going through Philippi. And so in those days, right, for commerce, and there was also it attracted many travelers to Philippi. It also was on the river side, we read that, right, in Acts 16, nearby Gangetus River, the modern day Angetus River. So that was also a natural advantage to the city. But we also can state that this was a very Gentile city. And next, let's ask another question. How did the church at Philippi start? How did God plant his church in this Gentile city? Of course, as we have read in Acts 16, right? We see a lot of that background there. We're not going to again read the passage, but the passage that we read, right? Um, in verses 6 to 14, we see how the Lord led Paul to the city and how the Lord used Paul and others, right? Uh, um, and Lord, how they used him. So we see, I think at a broad level, right? How did the Lord lead uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy? Uh, we see, I think we can say that, okay, there were two things as we look at this, several verses from verse 6, 6 to 40. First, we see the Spirit of God led Paul, right? I mean, that's really amazing. We see like, and then Paul submits himself. He does not question. He submits himself to the Spirit of God. We saw in verse 6, he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit from ministering nation. <coughs> he was prohibited to go to Bithynia, verse 7. Then it says, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow him. So what did he do? Right. Unlike Jonah, right? What did he He obeys. So here, the Lord shut the doors of Paul, right? He was thinking one way, and the Lord shut that door. So this morning, dearly beloved, we should recognize that God, in his provision, providence, often directs our path. He directs us, but he directs our paths not in the way that we think, and in the ways that we understand is best, but he directs our path by shedding some doors. And he wants us to go somewhere. And that's what he does this to, and uh, we see in the life of Paul. And they see where they ended up serving. So our task, we are reminded, is to faithfully carry out the work that the Lord has for us. Not in the way that we think best, but just following the leading of the Spirit of God. So what does Paul do? He submits himself to the Spirit of God. He receives a vision from a man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 9. Just as Philip was led to the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and Peter was led to Cornelius, so we see here, God in his providence leads Paul to Macedonia. <coughs> And so in submission to the Spirit of God, Paul and his team, they left Macedonia. And of course, they conclude that this is, the Lord has called them to preach the gospel in the region of Macedonia. <clears throat> and so 
dearly beloved, I think the Lord is also teaching us, right? He carries out his plan to preach the gospel through his servants. He uses ordinary servants, people, to fulfill his mission. The question is, do we recognize that? There was, there was a man in the vision who asked for help. Do we recognize that there are many who need our help? Even this day, this moment, they may not say it loud, but many are pleading, come help us. <clears throat> Submission to the Spirit of God is essential. The Lord would use it, use us as his instruments to proclaim the gospel, to plant his church. And so the path to joy is a path of submission to the Spirit of God and to the obedience of the Great Commission, the proclamation of the Gospel. And so in this passage, right, we see several evangelistic encounters. First, we see Lydia, the meeting with Lydia and some of the other ladies. Normally, what is Paul's practice? He enters a city, he goes to a synagogue, isn't it? On the Sabbath. But we don't see any uh, uh, mention of that. So as uh, probably we can say two things. Philippi was a military colony and probable, probable that um, because of that, um, we did not see any um, synagogue there. Also probably there were less than few, few fewer than 10 Jew, Jewish men in that city. So they cannot find a synagogue, right? The closest thing that they do is something like a women's prayer meeting by, by the side of a river, right? We see that um, uh, in verse 13. So Paul and his team, Silas, I think we can see that Silas was part of that, Timothy was part of that, uh, and then Luke, they approach them, right, with all humility. In this quiet event, we see the origins of the first church on the European soil, it starts coming together in the will of God. So, first encounter with Lydia and some other some ladies. Lydia was a woman of wealth, a dealer in purple God. Here it says, who worshipped God, but that does not mean she worshipped the true God. She was, she was a God-fearer. But when Paul began teaching, what happens? God opens her heart and mind to believe the gospel. She and her household, they believed and they were baptized. And then we see she immediately acts, she shows hospitality by inviting Paul's team to stay with her. God opened her heart. She opened her home. Dearly beloved, this morning as we see this event, how encouraging it is for us to note that you and I share the gospel. You and I are not on our own. The Spirit of God is at work. He works in the hearts of many, even in this day and age. Lydia here starts her day outside of Christ, and she ends her day as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the next evangelistic encounter was with a, in this event with a slave girl, verses 16 to 24. Paul cast out the spirit of divination from a slave, slave girl. So this girl was bringing profit to her oppressive uh, owners, right, from fortune telling. And Paul cast the spirit out and that this transformation did not please the owners of this slave girl. So what happens? They take Paul and Silas before the magistrates. They had them flogged and imprisoned. So we see whenever the work of the Lord is, is, is being, uh, the, the, the gospel of the Lord, the ministry is going on, there is a battle, right? Immediately we see suffering here. And we see that what happens next, right? They were flogged, they were imprisoned. The next encounter we see is with the Philippian jailer. In verse 25 we see, right? Paul and Silas, they began praying and singing hymns to God while in prison. Again, think about it, right? They were flogged, they were beaten for their service 
to the Lord Jesus Christ, and now they are in prison. Humanly speaking, very difficult circumstances. But we see a remarkable example dearly beloved. There is joy in the difficult circumstances that we encountered as we as uh, uh, that we encounter as we proclaim the good news of the gospel. The question to I and I is: Do we follow the example of Paul and Silas? Do we praise God in the midst of suffering? So I think this powerfully illustrates to our, right, Paul's command to rejoice always that we see in Philippians chapter 4. Paul is not just writing to the believers saying that, okay, you rejoice in the Lord. But he's showing him, showing it by his example in his own life. And we see as a result, God shakes the earth. We see the earthquake. Not only that God shakes the earth, he shakes the heart of one particular individual. We see that is the jailer. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. This jailer initially fears for his life because he fails to do his job. But then Paul comforts him. And the jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What a beautiful thing it is. God was at work in the heart of Lydia, in the event to the slave girl, and now we see God at work in the life of this Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas says that all he needs to do was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the jailer and his family, they were saved, they believed, and they were baptized. Dearly beloved, what a joy it is to note that the Lord opens people's heart in response to the gospel. And so, like Lydia, the jailer also here shows hospitality. He brings these evangelists to his house. He feeds them and he washes their wounds. And in verses 35 to 40, we see the series of interaction with the magistrates, the police. And then Paul and Silas, they received the apology. They were released and they were asked to leave the city. <clears throat> And so before they left, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers and they departed. So we see the church apparently had grown and we see that Lydia made her, you can say that her home available as a house church. The Lord used her, her wealth and her home as a means of building up the first church on European soil and in advancing the gospel. So that's the answer to the question. How did the Lord use, what means did he use to build his church, to plant his church at Philippi? I think we can see like right, Lydia and her family probably were part of that church along with some other women. I think we see that in terms of disunity in chapter four, we see Yudio and Syntyche, right? So they were the Lord, they were part of the church. Probably the slave girl the jailer and his family and some others. And Paul also visits them on his third missionary journey. So as we see this, how the Lord uses the remind to us is, are we willing sub to submit ourselves to the Spirit of God? And are we willing to be moved by evangelistic passion that Paul and Silas had? Doing the work of an evangelist, may the Lord use us in this regard. Let's now ask another question. Where and when? Where was Paul when he wrote Philippians and when was it written? We see, right? He was a confined prisoner. We know that. Chapter 1, verse 13. He did not know whether or not he would be sentenced to life or death. Again, chapter 1. In spite of his miserable circumstances, difficult circumstances, Paul was joy, uh, joyous. Now the question is, we know that Paul was in prison so many times in his life, right? Innumerable times he was put in prison, he was lashed, he was whipped. Much of Paul's life was spent in and out of prison, right? Served in many jails, spent time in a jail in Philippi. We just read that. He spent time in a jail in Jerusalem, Acts 21. In, in Caesarea, in Acts 23 and 24. And he spent time in jail in Rome as well, Acts 28. 
The best evidence seems to point, and I would suggest that Paul wrote Philippians when he was imprisoned in Rome, the first Roman imprisonment, Acts 28. The place where the whole imperial guard was located, that was Rome, right? We see in first chapter 1, verse 13, the imperial guard was located. It was a place where Caesar's house was located, again, which was Rome. It was a place, or chapter 4, it was a place that could sentence a person to life or death. Again, that should have been Rome. The circumstances of the imprisonment fit Rome. And so Paul was under house arrest. Right? We, start, we, we noticed that when we started the introduction to the book of Colossians, Acts 28. Right? He was in Rome for two years, where visitors were, were allowed. He was chained to a Roman guard at all times. But he lived under house arrest. He received visitors. He freely preached the gospel. We see that in Acts um, 28. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And then we see Paul's later second imprisonment was in the dungeon in the mid 60s, resulted in his martyrdom. So this one. I would point, uh, say that it was around uh, AD 60 and 62. The, quest, the fifth question, let's ask ourselves. Why did Paul write the letter to the Philippians? Again, from the, from the letter, I think we can glean a few things. Of course, there might be a lot more here or like, you know, just some suggestions uh, that I came across and that godly men have proposed. <laughs> so to show Paul's care for them, right? We see that in chapter 1, verse 7. <coughs> He cared a great deal for the people of this church. He loved them. He thought about them. And to show his appreciation and thank them, right? they supported Paul in a big way, financially. Right? He wanted them to know that by doing that, they had laid up a great account, treasure in heaven. And as he was thinking about the fact that he could die, he was thinking about these dear people who had supported him, and he appreciated them. And he wanted them to know. He also wanted, uh, I would say, wrote this to inform them about his circumstances, right? About his status. We see that uh, his information in chapter one and two about Timothy, chapter two, and about Epaphroditus. From this, we may learn that Paul was, you know, had this heart, was open in his communication, and he wanted them to know exactly what was happening. Also, in a way, it was to warn them against false teaching and to establish them in the faith. Paul wanted believers. They wanted, he wanted them to be strong in the, in, in the faith. And they want, he wanted them to know that they, were, they are saved by faith in Christ alone, not by any keeping of the law. Right? He was concerned about some type of false doctrine that could get into the church. And he warned them against the legalistic Judaizers against those who do, do shameful things with their bodies and minds. We see that in chapter, chapter 3. And the, I, I would say another uh, reason why Paul, uh, uh, why Paul wrote this is to exhort them to maintain unity. Uh, I just read uh, probably one verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel we know paul addresses the theme of unity in several letters including this book as we have just read it was very important to him it should not just be important to paul it should be important to all of us here in the universal church and in our local churches here also especially at artsley bible chapel so the call for us is, let's abound in unity. Let's grow in unity. Let's avoid any things that would disunite us, that would divide us. Let's, yes, we would have differences, probably in some theological positions or others, but let's not argue or fight over the non-essentials. Let's pursue unity by focusing on the gospel. Right? That's what we are called to do. The church in Philippi was a great church, yet they needed this reminder to seek unity. Even the best of churches have to be alert. And so 
I would say that's another reason. And we see Paul's, Paul wanted them to be Christ-like, right? What was Christ mentality? Others first, right? Others first oriented mindset. Do, do nothing, we, we have read that earlier, from selfish ambition. But in humility, count others more significant <coughs> than others. So I think these are some indicators, some suggestions. Uh, why was, why Paul wrote Philippians? And so why should we study? I think we already have seen some reasons why we should study. Uh, and I would, uh, again, uh, you know, just briefly mention this, right? First, any book of the Bible, it is all the in inspired word of God, right? That should be the primary reason. We have and how privileged we are to have the inspired word of God. All scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable. It is profitable to us. Philippians is a book that exalts Jesus Christ and it urges us to make him known. Right? We should it encourages us to exalt Christ, to imitate him, and to proclaim him to the world. The word Christ or Jesus or Lord is mentioned almost 64 times in this 104 verses, just in those four chapters. The Lord Jesus Christ is the key to everything. He's the key to salvation. He's a source of joy and unity. And so this book challenges us to know this exalted Christ, to serve him. Again, we need to be reminded as we obey him to, in, in service of this great God, there will be a cost to us. That's what we see in the book of Philippians. It exalts the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only savior and the Lord whom we adore and proclaim and as difficulties come, as suffering comes, as persecution comes, we see the Lord Jesus Christ is worth living, it's also worth dying for. And Paul speaks of this, and he speaks of the glorious day of Christ coming. He is imprisoned for Christ, honors Christ. May this study make us love Jesus Christ more. Let's exalt him. Let's love him more. And let that fill us with a fresh courage and boldness to make this exalted Christ, <coughs> make him known to the world. Again, we already touched upon this. This book emphasizes joy at all times and at all circumstances. The psalmist says, right, in Psalm 100, serve the Lord with gladness. Paul gives us a picture of what joyful service to Jesus Christ looks like. The joy comes from Christ. It can be experienced even in suffering. This joy flows from our union with Christ. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a profound contentment, satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that in whatever circumstances we can say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Our relationship with Christ can make us joyful. You can also state that Philippians is, is a very positive and uplifting book, right? When we go to Colossians, it's a, it's a good book for us to be warned. But as you see this book, right? Like, as I said, most books of the Bible have some warnings and rebukes, but not, I don't see that much in Philippians. It was a letter written to a reasonably good church in which the believers were doing well by and large. When man of God said, this is the most beautiful of all Pauline epistles. Yes, the church was not perfect. There were a few minor problems because when you have sinful people still in the flesh, we will have that. We are born to expect that. There will always be a few minor issues. But they were nothing too serious and nothing real negative. And so this, my hope is, it will be a very convicting book to all of us. It's not just a convicting book, right? There are minor issues that we need to be warned of, but it's a very positive book. And then that's another reason I would say that why we should study this book. And then another aspect, right? We already touched upon this, right? Why Paul writes this. It challenges us to be cheerful givers. A call to become a Macedonian giver. Paul thanks the Philippians for their generous, loyal, God-honoring <coughs> support. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, Paul remarks on the exemplary generosity of the churches of Macedonia. 
They were not necessarily always wealthy, probably there were some exceptions, but they were sacrificial, they were generous, they were cheerful, they were loyal. What moved them to give? The treasure, the Lord Jesus Christ above all. And so here in Philippians, Paul says that they gave as an expression of love, as an act of worship. They were loyal to Paul and the mission and they were devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, that's also a good reason why we should study Philippians. And that also should cause us to search our own lives. And then, now coming to uh, verses 1 and 2, probably will take another 10 minutes. <clears throat> uh, the interaction, right? Philippians 1, verses 1 and 2. First we see introduction to the senders of the letter, the names and positions. We see the names were Paul and Timothy. They were used by the Lord significant and they had an significant and had an impact in Philippi. We saw all that thing. Even Timothy had a powerful ministry in Macedonia and Paul hoped to send Timothy to Philippi in the near future. He was a gifted, faithful worker of God, and he served alongside. And so Paul did not hesitate putting this young man, Timothy, alongside his own name as Paul writes this letter to the uh, believers at Philippi. And so Paul also did not know at the time when he will be executed. And he puts his stamp of approval on someone he could trust and who, who could continue his ministry. That was his son in the faith, Timothy. So it's a call for us as well. The church of God needs faithful men. The church of God needs young, gifted, proven, faithful men who would learn the doctrine, who would learn the importance of the word of God, who would faithfully serve alongside other gifted, God-gifted leaders. So one day it will be time for the younger generation, the youngest youngsters, the young men to take over. Paul had that kind of confidence in Timothy. And so Paul also, not just by name, he identifies by position. <coughs> Who are they? Servants, born servants, slaves. So how will one become a slave? There are three ways, right? By conquest, by birth, and because of debt. But again, I think as we think about us being slaves, we were slaves to sin. We were all slaves of sin. Sin has conquered us. We are sinners by birth with a nature that is hostile towards God and we are sinners by debt with an unpayable debt towards a holy God. And only Christ by his substitutionary death to the cross of Calvary can set us free from the bondage of sin. That's, that's what the Lord did to Paul and to Timothy. Now they are free. They are free from the bondage of sin and now they are slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And Paul is the only letter, Philippians is the only letter in which Paul classifies himself and Timothy this way as born servants, right? Both of them as lowly slaves, born servants, dedicated to their master, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were bound to the Lord Jesus Christ. The question to us this morning is, what are we bound to? What do we serve? Who is our master? What is our master in our lives? The call for us is to be bound, born servants, servants, slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the recipients of this letter, we see, right? They're all believers who have comprised, who comprise the Philippian church. Again, we see the word saints. The term saint refers here to one's position, right? We're all saints. We have all been called out, we are separated for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are holy, sanctified, consecrated. We are set apart ones. Set apart, set apart for a special purpose for the sake of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it says, not the saints, but to all the saints. It's written to all the saints and the believers in Philippi. The ones who are living there in Philippi and are part of the Philippian church. There's another interesting thing that we have to note. I think we should not uh, just disregard it, right? Who are at Philippi with, in the greetings, we see the statement here, with the <coughs> overseers and the deacon. By the time Paul wrote this letter, probably like the church was 10 to 12 years old. 
and uh, you know the two main offices of leadership has been established elders overseers and deacons right we know from the scripture these offices are held by brothers by men not by women and when we think about the term overseer or the term elder like it determines the responsibility to oversee to guard the flock of God the church of God right there was a structure leadership and the Philippian church was governed by elders again here it says overseers elders plural not singular I think we have we need to note that not singular both and also we see the office of the deacons again deacons right wherever it's possible I had plural office uh, deacons not singular and both overseers or elders and deacons were fully functioning in this church the question is why does Paul bring this subject in the greeting of this letter I think this is the only letter in the entire scripture where we see these two mentioned in the opening greeting again I think that talks about the importance of the structure elders and deacons should be the structure of the New Testament church and Paul wanted them to realize this truth as they being the first church in Europe and to show the people in the church that there is authority structure in a local church so I think we need to uh, note that as well and then after looking at the senders by name and by position and the recipients of this letter we see in uh, verse 2 we see the greeting of grace and greeting of peace and these are the and the source of these are they are it is God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace is what Paul preached it's the work of God in Jesus Christ that extends salvation to those of us who do not deserve it who cannot merit it who cannot earn it that God giving us what we do not deserve it's a relationship with God that is unmerited, unearned, unearned, undeserved. And what is the source? We see the source is source of grace is God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul and Timothy, they were recipients of this grace. They were transformed by this grace. Right? Paul on the road to Damascus, concerning Timothy, he was his mother was Jewish, his father was Greek. But he became a believer by God's grace. He heard the gospel and he believed. Grace, how precious that is. Next we see, as we conclude, we see peace. Peace is the state of overall spiritual well-being. The quietness of knowing God is in control. It's a work of God in which sinful men, right? we were all sinful men, we are reconciled to God. And we are brought into a peaceful relationship with God. The relationship becomes tranquil, becomes peaceful because the sin issue, slaves to sin, that issue has been dealt with. Again, where does this come from? Peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Source of peace. Without a relationship with God the Father and God the Son, one will never have true peace in their lives. So Paul wants them to think about this. So even this morning as we conclude, the question is, have, have you been, is there anyone in the sound of this word who have not been transformed by the grace of God, who don't have the peace of God? That was the situation of Lydia. That was the situation of the slave girl. That was the situation of the jailer. That was the situation of Paul and Timothy. But they were all transformed by the grace of God. So this morning, the call is accept the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then if we do that, we will have peace, we will have rest, we will have blessing. And then as a result, we who are God's children, who have the peace, who have been recipients of the grace of God and who have peace with God, we are called to live a life of holiness, a life of service, and a life that emulates the Lord Jesus Christ, just as we have seen in the introduction this morning. The foundation for joy is to be a recipient of God's peace, God's grace, and peace in this Christ. So this uh, peace in Christ. 
So this morning we can thank the Lord for this beautiful book as we have seen the introduction. Right? So many precious truths. So my desire is as we continue this, the study of this book in the next several weeks, may the Lord talk to us in, uh, in a more personal way. And shall we recommit our lives? Shall we see the preciousness of the grace of God? And shall we emulate the Lord Jesus Christ? Shall we always keep excel in rejoicing, no matter what? An epistle of joy. Shall we abound in unity? And shall we be generous givers? So may the Lord help us, and so shall we ask the Lord's help. Loving Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for the way that you spoke to us, Lord, this morning. Thank you for this short book of four, four chapters, 104 verses. How much wealth of spiritual precious truths it has for us, Lord. And so, Lord, this morning, we ask for your strength and help, Lord, for us as to understand this and to put this into practice in our lives. At the same time, Lord, I pray for all those who don't have joy in their lives, no, don't have satisfaction in their lives, that they can recognize that it is only obtained in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, just as so many whom we have studied this morning have put their trust in. So I pray for the salvation as well. Again, Lord, we thank you for this time. And also, Lord, we pray that you bless the time that is spent in fellowship over the meal. Pray that you would bless all the hands that prepared this. And as we partake of this, Lord, give us the health, health and strength to use this for your extension of, uh, for, for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. And also, Lord, we remember the many who don't have this privilege, Lord, the household of faith, of the people of the household of faith, that you would supply all the needs and also use us, Lord, to take care of the needs of fellow believers. Again, Lord, this morning, we thank you for your word and we give you all the glory. In Jesus Christ's precious name, we pray.